Welcome to the Flipping the Barrel podcast, a podcast where we deep dive into the stories of energy leaders across our industry and find out more about their career and life journey. Today, we have the pleasure of speaking with Katie Dickinson. She is the vice, Senior Vice President of Technology and Engineering for Patterson UTI. She began her career as a rig engineer for TransOcean. She worked on the Discoverer Enterprise in Deepwater Horizon in the Gulf of Mexico. She has 20 years of oil and gas experience, and she recently had a baby, so congrats, congratulations, Katie. Um, and she just got back from maternity leave, so this episode is going to be really interesting. When I met with Katie, it was very inspiring to hear from a woman who had grown most of her career in a very male-dominated space in the oil and gas industry, which is in technology and engineering. And more importantly, too, just having a baby and coming back um, and in such a such a big role at Patterson. It was really interesting to hear her feedback on what she learned from maternity leave and really where she's at today and how that's impacted her leadership and how she's been able to use that um, as, a base, as a benefit to her really um, and her experience. So Katie, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for having me. I'm excited to visit with you today. Well, thanks, Katie. And, and as I was saying, you know, it was really interesting um, speaking with you and I want to start from the very beginning because you grew up in Deer Lodge, Montana, where you were very hands on. Um, and I thought this was really interesting, especially knowing your background today and the role that you were in. Uh, you were really big into like refurbishing cars, which, you know, a lot of women today probably wouldn't say that was one of their hobbies. And for you, it was. And for me, that's very inspiring. So I'd love to hear about how you know, being in Montana, working with your dad and your brother, um, refurbing cars, being outdoors, being very adventurous, how this, you know, really curated kind of your work ethic, but also what you ended up studying in college. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think I've always just been very curious to know how things work. Um, I, I like to figure things out on my own. I like to be hands on. Um, so even even growing up, I was constantly kind of studying things. Um, working on cars just happened to be a hobby that my my dad and my brother, like you mentioned, were very very into, and so naturally I was drawn into that as well, and um, was able to to learn a lot of things mechanically um, in the process. I think also just being in Montana, it's a little bit different. I'm, I'm finding um, whether it's it's the state of Montana and maybe it's not as densely populated or even northern states in general, um, from a, a gender standpoint, um, it's maybe a little bit more normal for, for women to, to get involved in, you know, working on cars, building cabinets, whatever it may be. There's, there's not as many eyebrows that are raised when you say that. So um, I think that also was, it may have helped shape my decision to pursue a, a career, first a degree and then a career in, in technology and engineering. So, Well, working with your brother and your father, I know we talked about like gender roles and how you really didn't see that um, very different growing up. Can you tell us a little bit about that and how that you use that experience today um, in the working in, in a male dominated space? You don't really see it that way. Yeah, I suppose maybe um, being young and in more of your formative years, um, because I I didn't sense that there should be a difference maybe between what a male pursues to um, or chooses to pursue, excuse me, in, in a career versus a female. Uh, maybe that helped instill a greater degree of confidence. Yeah, I really, um, I really loved hearing about what it was like for for you growing up and and the the mechanical aspect of it. So you you ended up graduating with mechanical engineering degree, and this was another interesting thing in your journey. Was at Montana Tech, a lot of the graduates had already found jobs, and so you were one that was still trying to experience. You know, where do I want to work? What do I want to do? And you really didn't feel like the oil and gas industry was a great fit. Um, so you decided to take a trip to Europe, <laughs> um, which I found really inspiring at that time, because now you hear it a lot, like the younger generation is very big on going overseas and seeing the different culture differences. But 20 or so years ago, I don't think in North America in general, that wasn't like a really big thing that people were doing. Um, and you decided that it was something you wanted to experience. Um, tell us about 
what it was like at that time when knowing all your your colleagues or your sorry your your um, other people you were working with at a sorry not even working with <laughs> um now you got me now you got me tripping up um all the people that you were graduating with having a degree and you found yourself without one um talk to me about that experience and then what it was like when you decided to take that trip yeah it was a running joke in my family um during the commencement ceremony the chancellor said something like look out and in- in front of you as this graduating class and over 90%, I don't remember the exact exact number, 95% or something, have jobs. And I'm kind of going, hi, mom and dad, you know, <laughs> look at me. I'm one of the few that, that doesn't. Um, I had interviewed with a number of companies that placed mechanical engineers and it just, the roles, the opportunities weren't of interest to me. It was doing things like making gypsum board in a factory, right? Um, and I, I hadn't really interviewed for many with many companies in the oil and gas sector. Um, I think when I was going through the degree program, a lot of the students may have chosen to enter that field because they, they just looked at what's the highest starting salary and, um, and chose petroleum engineering based on that. And so I think when you're younger, you probably are a little bit more idealistic. Um, and not meaning to paint everyone with a, a broad broad brush by any means, um, but that probably was a, a little bit of a negative, um, con- had a negative connotation for me, excuse me. Um, so I didn't, um, while I was still in, in school, I didn't pursue too many opportunities. But once I graduated and, and um, needed to to get more serious about opportunities. I did reach out to just different networks, some different friends that I had. Um, a couple of them happened to be working for Transocean and I was able to secure an interview. Um, and then once I got to know the company better, once I understood the operation and um, this prospect of working out in the Gulf of Mexico on these big drill ships and the cutting te- edge technology, it was like, yeah, that's that's pretty cool. I'd much rather be doing that than making gypsum board in a factory. Um, so I was, I was glad that I kind of opened my um, perception or my my horizon, if you will, um, and and considered that um, I've been I haven't looked back since. I think once I once I really entered the industry, um, I better understand um, how important it is to society um, and and really how conscientious the individuals are within the industry as well. Yeah, I I have to fully agree with you. And I think a lot of people, when they have those reservations and then they enter the industry, they really realize, you know, how great it is, but more importantly, like how close knit it is as as well. Like it's a big industry, but yet it feels small because you feel like you kind of know everybody in it. Um, You know, in your early years, you just talked about working offshore and your schedule was pretty tough. So you had two weeks offshore, two weeks onshore two weeks offshore with 12 days off. So that's uh, that's definitely not for the week. Um, and reflecting on that experience, you know, it was 20 years ago and those rigs initially that you worked on, um, they have since been retired. However, when we spoke, you mentioned that Transocean tried to take very good care of you and, and the rig that they did put you on, you know, hopefully they would have like the suitable amenities. And, you know, this is a big conversation topic for now. And so looking at that and the experiences that you had, what do you think we can do better, um, especially in today's age, to further support women in those off- offshore um, positions? Yeah. First of all, whether you're a male or you're a female, um, I highly, highly encourage you to take the opportunity when you enter the industry, um, do the field work, take the time to, to go out, learn the operation, learn the equipment, learn the processes, become better acquainted with your organization. Um, it is really important to establish that foundation for your future career progression. It doesn't matter if you go up through operations, if you go up through technology roles, um, there is no crash course, there, there is no cliff notes that would replace that. You have to put in the time, you have to be willing to put in the hard work. Um, I think a lot of uh, engineers, when they come out of, out of school, they aren't used to that. They aren't used to going straight into the field and um, and maybe more of the harsh conditions associated with that. They're used to more of the, the classroom time. Um, and it's, it's just so important. So I would really encourage everyone to stay the course and, and put in the time and, and really have that longer term outlook um, and investing in yourself. Um, as it relates to females and supporting more females in the field, there's no doubt amenities is a, a 
big area that we need to make sure that we're um, we're focused on creating the right environment for them to be successful. Like you mentioned, 20 years ago, I was fortunate that there were drill ships that I was able to work on um, that had their own their own room. So I was um, I was able to be comfortable in how I slept and had their own facilities, bathroom facilities, etc. Even today at Patterson UTI Drilling, we're designing bunkhouses that are very similar to that. They have their own sleeping quarters, they have their own bathrooms, and we're doing that in an effort to try to attract more females into into the industry and to be able to do to do the field work. Um, another story that I really like sharing, I've, I've visited with different groups over the years. Um, when I first joined Patterson UTI Drilling and I got involved in our, our rig up yard program, um, we were ramping up. We were hiring more people to be able to deliver more rigs. And I think probably prior to me being in, in this position, they hadn't really seen what does it look like to have a female on the mm-hmm. team and be capable? What does it look like to um, be able to, to become more diverse? And I think I was fortunate having um, a, a project team that was very open to that. And so as we went into recruiting, they actually wanted to hire more females. It was it was a goal of theirs and they were successful. They hired more, more females to physically work on the pad crews, assembling rigs, commissioning rigs. I remember I walked out to the, the rig up yard one day and walked out onto the pads. At that time, we didn't have permanent facilities in our yard. We relied on porta potties. In every single pad, there was a pink porta potty set up. <laughs> Just something that small, right? Something something that small can give a long way in making making people feel more comfortable in the workplace. And it's important that as leaders, we think about that. And I love that you said pink because I feel like we'd be able to locate that on location or in the rig yard or wherever we're at. Because uh, that is that is an important aspect. And a lot of times I mean, when you're in the field, you know, guys kind of have the pleasure of maybe even have the opportunity to not have to use amenities and they can go anywhere. <laughs> and women don't really have that. And so I think it's really important, like you said, to, um, you know, amenities is just number one. Right. So I, I love hearing that story and and what Patterson is doing today. Um, you know, on the subject of Patterson, they hired you in 2012 um, as a, in a VP role, and you left a smaller drilling company um, that you were working at. And when you told me about this story and just thinking about, you know, your entire career journey in general, it made me really think, like, how in a role like an engineering position, do you get known? Like, how were you able to build your reputation and were able to reflect that to where other people knew who you were and you were able to get these, these incredible roles? Cause I, from a sales standpoint, I can see like for myself, it was, okay, well, they saw me in the offices all the time. They saw that obviously I was selling tools. So they would then speak to me and then they're like, okay, yeah, she's a good salesperson. I want to hire her. But I feel like in an engineering type role might be a little bit more difficult to expand your network. Um, how were you able to do that and build that reputation that you have today? Yeah, um, you hear a lot of people ask the question, what's what's the recipe to success and career progression? How do I make sure that I'm noticed and how do I make sure that I'm um, I'm given an opportunity to advance my career? And I, I think for me, it's it's just do good work. And, and a lot of times the reward for good work is more work and, and typically more work then will come um, with advancements um, and promotions, it, it increased responsibility. So I think it's just really important to be focused on um, your area of responsibility, do your job really well, be timely, and then pick your head up and really understand how can you have a positive impact on your team, on the organization, how can you help move things forward. Um, and I think if you do that really well, if you stay consistent, you'll you'll be recognized um, and, and good things will likely follow. I think it's also important to have that longer term outlook. Um, I think especially when you're younger in your career, it can become easy to, to get a little bit more frustrated on maybe decisions that are being made around you, um, maybe that you don't have control over, and to, to remain consistent and, and kind of... Um, know that if you stay the course that that it will likely pay off can be important as well. Um, and then I think when you do do good work, um, just naturally people are, are drawn to you. Naturally, you build that rapport, that respect. Um, and the longer that you're in a position, the longer that you're in the industry, your network expands, which then mm-hmm. just allows you to become more more successful. You have more people that you can you can collaborate with, that you can lean on. Um, so it, it really just kind of snowballs from there. Did you ever experience a time where you entered a room and people were a bit surprised? That it was like, oh, Katie's running this meeting, 
Um, and I'm taking like I'm taking from, you know, a uh, guidelines from her or, you know, just that, just the perception, not that you didn't have the capability, but more or less just the perception of not being used to having a woman come in and an engineering technology role to tell a team, I would, I would assume probably mainly full of men, you know, what the next step is or, or, or what, you know, y'all might be working on. Did you ever experience that? And if so, well, how did you overcome it? Yeah, when you say a time, I could probably write a book on the number of times <laughs> um, I've I have experienced that. Unfortunately, um, where I I almost feel like when I first meet someone, and, and it's not everyone again, not to paint everyone with a broad brush, um, but it it can be often when you first meet someone and they aren't maybe used to um, seeing a female or even maybe. Um, other um, other characteristics in, in a role, you almost have to prove yourself. They may may make an assumption about why you're there, what you're capable of doing. And that can be a little bit frustrating that if you feel like over and over again, you have to put in the hard work to prove yourself to that you're confident, you're capable, um, you're, um, you're able to do that job. Um, it, it can be a little bit wearing at times, but again, it's it's that long term outlook. Stay the course, put in the work, and and you will kind of reap the the rewards later. I think is the the right approach to have, um, and just be be patient. I think don't overreact um, mm -hmm. is also a, maybe a good piece of advice that. Um, you can make a situation worse probably if if. Um, if you take it too sensitive. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, I, I like that you were so transparent in that and, and that not overreacting, I think is the biggest thing. Cause it's not always just about you. It's more about the, the people in the room, just not used to those char characteristics, kind of like you pointed out, um, on that topic, when we spoke, you know, you had talked about maternity leave um because you you had just um come back from that which congratulations uh but you talked about how companies lose out on opportunities for women due to maternity policies and this is something that uh we definitely see across the board especially ever since we started flipping the barrel this has been one of our biggest components of what we wanted to work on with most of the companies that we've spoken with and even the events that we do um and you experienced this firsthand uh and you were lucky per se i say that with like quotes around it you were lucky to get instead of six weeks you were able to get uh, the 12 weeks um, at Patterson, which was really, honestly, probably a lifesaver because I can only imagine what six weeks um, would have been like with you coming right back to work. Talk to us about why now experiencing this, why you think it's important um, to support women in this time of their life and what companies can do better. And then also, I remember when we spoke, you never really thought much about it until you experienced it yourself, which I think a lot of us could be in that boat where you don't really think about it and then when it happens to you, you're like, oh, wow, like this, this isn't, um, this isn't good. Like the, the situation that I'm in, it should be better and it should be better for other women. Yeah. This is a, a topic, like you mentioned, that's very, um, fresh and, mm -hmm. and very much on my mind having, um, just returned back to work from maternity leave a couple of months ago. Um, the year prior to going on maternity leave, my company actually didn't have a paid parental leave policy. So if you um, did need to take maternity leave, you needed to stock up on your, your paid time off and take that to be compensated while you're out. And then um, short term disability insurance would kick in and you may you may be compensated through that. But of course, it's at a much lower level than what your, your typical income would be. Um, and then within that year, prior to going on maternity leave, we did implement a paid parental leave policy that allowed four weeks of paid time off for the both the birthing and the non-birthing parent, uh, which was was great to have something. Um, we've also been been hiring a lot of people in the technology positions in our company and and we've had candidates give us feedback that we probably aren't as progressive as we needed to be in that area and it was something that i was i was trying to advocate to improve to improve this policy um in in push but probably didn't appreciate how it felt until i was living it until mm -hmm. i went on parental leave and then it's you have so many um 
changes in your life. You have um, a lot of challenges that you're up against. A lot of family are dual income families. And all of a sudden you're you're looking at, you know, you have a, another child, whether it's your first child or additional child that you're needing to support, you're needing to house, you're needing to feed. Um, and to have also a negative impact on your income at the same time can be really difficult. Um, I don't think companies think that they're, I don't, I don't think any company intends to send a message to new families, um, employees that they don't support them expanding their family. They, they don't um, support them taking that step, but it can almost feel like that when it's, it's you're being personally affected in that way. Um, so luckily, like you mentioned, while I was out um, and as part of the merger with next year, we did update that policy. And now for the birthing, birthing parents, it's 12 weeks paid parental. Um, time off. And it just it just makes all the difference in the world. Um, I think when employees feel like they're supported, especially in these big life events by their their companies, they're going to come back, they're going to be happier, they're going to be more productive. You're going to see that in your retention numbers. Um, so I would really encourage if, if there are policymakers out there to really consider being more progressive in this area. Um, I think it will it will pay off in the long run, and especially at larger corporations, it doesn't impact the bottom line. There's mm -hmm. there's not too much of a downside to it. Yeah, staying on that topic, you know, we talk a lot about what prevents women from advancing, and you just even talking about maternity policies or parents will leave and dual careers. I think there's a lot in there that does really hold women back if their companies are not supporting them. Um, and despite having all these metrics and all of these, you know, gender um, diversity rules internally of these ERGs and all of the support internally that companies are trying to do, what do you think is still holding women from these positions and especially experiencing what you did and then coming back from maternity leave, you even kind of understand like that difference of it's it's it is easier not having children. So once you do have a child, it does become more difficult. Um, so in in your experience, seeing the before and then the now, what do you think um, is is driving that that wedge for women in these in these um, top management roles? Yeah, this is again, like you said, another one that I have fresh insight and a <laughs> very new perspective, and even you know daily probably evolved mm -hmm. in in this area. Um, I'd heard people talk before about the guilt that you feel as a new mom and as a working mom and that now you're needing to split your time, your energy, your focus between work and, and home and family and not, never feeling like it's, it's good enough in either, either area. And I very much feel that way. Um, now, I think previously I was able to fully invest in, in my job. Um, I was I was able to work the long hours. I was able to travel whatever, whatever it was necessary to get ahead. Um, and I think I, I was able to probably advance um, in my career as a result of that. And and now I am taking not a step back, but I'm I'm really kind of understanding, OK, what's the right amount of energy um, and amount of time I can put into these projects, um, knowing that I need to be able to go home and I need to be able to spend time time with my um, family. Mm -hmm. And then also maybe some restrictions on, on travel that right now, especially with a, a newborn at home, that can become a challenge. Um, so I can appreciate that um, whether a, a working mom is is maybe choosing to not career, not pursue a career advancement because um, you feel like you don't have that extra time, you don't have that extra energy to put into that that may be contributing to, to not seeing more women in, in leadership roles. Um, there probably are instances where people are making assumptions for you in organizations that they think you're not going to want to, they think you don't have the time. Um, and it's, it's difficult to understand how can we start solving this, this issue? Um, because it's, it's, it's large. There's a lot of people that are involved and it's, it's kind of the more women that we have in leadership positions, especially working moms, the more they're going to appreciate the, the challenges that come with that. And I think then they're going to allow more opportunities and really try to help pull more women into those positions as well. Um, that's probably what it's going to take over, over the longer term to mm -hmm. see, um, to see more, more advancement in those areas. 
I would love to hear what you wanted, like what you would do today, given that you are in a senior vice president role, you do have the authority to really look at what it means for, you know, not just women, but dual career. So even when the men have to take the role and they want to take paternity leave and how, how have you, or how would you advance that, what you just said about making sure that, you know, they have the opportunity. Um, have you thought about anything that you would implement given that you do manage um, a large subset of people at, at Patterson? Oh gosh, could we, can I just put a daycare in the office? <laughs> <laughs> no, you can yeah. go for 24 hours and not have to worry about it, right? Yeah. Um, yeah, I know. I know that's not the solution. I can tell you that even personally, like I said, I've only been back a couple of months, but I am much more empathetic for all of my team members that have that have kids, um, you know, that they are pulled in, in several different directions. And um, and just personally, you know, kind of shifting expectations on on timelines for when projects should be done or what you're asking people to do. Um from a company program or policy standpoint, I really haven't thought about that. I really haven't thought about, you know, is there, are there more things that we can be putting in place um, or maybe just having more conversations so people are more aware? Um, it could be another, another good step. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I think I do believe having the conversations is really important. And that leads me to something I wanted to talk to you about as well before we close the podcast, which was on um, mentors and sponsors, because, you know, we talk a lot about even your career advancement, but even as, as a working mom today, um, you know, and a new mom, but more importantly, throughout your career, those that have sponsored and mentored you, I think that that is an aspect of a lot of women's advancement, especially early on. And what was your experience with this? And do you still have, you know, mentors and sponsors in the company you work with today? Mm -hmm. And I, I think that also goes back to kind of the the one piece of advice I would give if if you're asking what can I do to advance my career is just perform well, um, be consistent, be reliable, and when you do that, likely other leaders in the organization will recognize that and they will become your sponsor. Um, so you you probably don't need to be proactive in, in walking into someone's office and, and you know asking asking. Um, for, for that mentor opportunity, um, but just doing doing good work and people will find you, I think is is important. And I've I have been most successful and I guess lucky in that area throughout my my career. I've had some great leadership teams that I've I've worked with um, that luckily have recognized my capabilities and and allowed me to progress through the organization. Um, so I, I think that that is. Um, that is important to make sure that you are um, you are fostering, I guess, those those relationships and opportunities um, to help with that. And the last question I had for you was one that when we met, I was very intrigued by, and that was um, how you questioned the oil and gas industry in general. It was not. It was not a space that you wanted to be in. You didn't really understand the importance of fossil fuels. And then now, you know, 20 years later, it's been an industry that sucked you in and one that you love. Um, but we're seeing this negativity across the board right now with the younger generation. And it's it's really disheartening given all of the things that uh, the energy industry provides each and one of us every day. Um, what would you say to those that are that do have that negative connotation that you did once experience before you really understood um, and were a part of the industry itself. We um, we have been developing a college recruiting program the last several years. So I've had the opportunity to interview a lot of college students. And it is amazing um, how many of them ask us, why did you choose this career? What are you doing to invest in um, alternative energy sources, renewable energy sources? So there's there's no doubt that this continues to be um, a topic that is very important to our younger generation. And even me graduating 20 years ago, um, I think I was idealistic. And I think, um, like I mentioned before, even going through college, I didn't have the, the best perception or um, I, maybe it wasn't as positive as it is now of the oil and gas sector. And probably for five years, maybe even more after graduating, I question if it was the right long-term um, profession or sector for me to be in. Um, I remember reading a book 
four or five years ago now that was called Factfulness by Hans Rosling. Um, it's, it's an interesting book in that it takes a very statistical approach to understanding where are we today as a, as a society, a civilization versus a century ago. And when you really start looking at that, looking at the numbers, it's amazing how much we've advanced in the last century. If you look at um, people's access to energy, electricity, vaccines, women's access to education, um, the impact of natural disasters, it, it's it's amazing. And this book wasn't specifically meant to highlight oil and gas or, or fossil fuels um, contribution in those areas. But when I was reading it, I, I just was reflecting on you know, all of this is possible because of mm -hmm. fossil fuels. We wouldn't be anywhere close to um, as, as advanced as we are in these areas if, if we didn't have that. And it did allow me to become even more proud in um, coming to work every day and really contributing um, and, and knowing that we're playing such an important role in driving the improvement of, of people's general well-being. It's something mm -hmm. to be very proud of. I love that. And thank you so much, Katie, for answering that so beautifully. I think it's so important um, for us to really highlight the positive things that we do for, for the world. And, and to your point, um, you know, we would not probably have this AI technology advancement or even technology roles that we have today if it wasn't for fossil fuels, because we just wouldn't have advanced far enough to even have it. So I, I think it's just really important for, um, for every generation um, and the younger generation to really understand that. So I really appreciate your, your perspective and uh, you coming on the podcast today and sharing your journey with us. And I know when we started, you mentioned that you didn't get much sleep last night. Um, <laughs> so I think you did a great job. So uh, thank you so much, Katie, for sharing your journey with us today and all the experiences that you had. And more importantly, really sharing with us what it's like to be coming back after maternity leave and having the a senior vice president role that you have today, kind of the impact of that in your leadership and really what it means for the women in the organization and for you to keep pushing on and, and providing that support for them and for all of us. Uh, so we really appreciate you being so transparent and, um, and sharing what that was like with us today. Appreciate it. Thanks. Thanks, Katie. If you like this podcast, please like, subscribe, leave us a comment, leave us a note, find us on um, LinkedIn, flippingthebarrel.com, or our social media platforms. Uh, we'd love to hear from you. We'll see you at the next podcast.